We are live, San Bonani, and um, hello from Southern Africa. And welcome back, Rob and Ron. And uh, welcome back anyone who, uh, who is at the other end of this broadcast. Sorry, I stumbled there because the energy I'm feeling right now is so profoundly expansive and amazing. So Robin, um, thank you for coming on a second talk. Um, your first talk had such an incredible impact on people, such a reach across the world with so many um, responses and questions and feedback to you that we, as long as we can, have to definitely keep on talking. Um, and one of the things somebody asked you, which is an amazing question is how did you know what the elephants were telling you so sorry before we get there i'd like to just say please if anybody has questions or comments um when robin has broken some more we will i'll have a look at them and so please ask your questions live robin will answer them um or if you've got any comments or any feedback there's something really extraordinary happening since Robin spoke for the very first time to me, and it was my privilege to be at the other end of it. So let it go where it goes. And Rob, let's should we launch into that question? How did you know? How did you know what message the elephants were giving you? Well, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know, and I didn't think it was. I didn't think it was fabulous. It was absolutely terrible. I didn't think anything was okay. So the message I have now from the experience that I went through is that everything is really exactly as it should be. And um, everything's, everything's okay, even though it doesn't feel like it. And I, I do think it's important that I back up a little bit to that original elephant. And I won't go through that. Anyone that does want to hear, please do listen to Antoinette's first interview of me um, and just bear with us while I speak about it for the first time because it was really hard to know where to start and where to stop. But the first elephant was simply a conversation I'd had. It wasn't simple. It was a conversation I'd had under very difficult circumstances that included my son talking about an elephant on the way to see my husband in hospital. And my mom had been... Um, had an attempted murder. There was a lot of stuff happening in our lives that was really, really very uh, traumatic, including the fact that we may, in fact, lose my husband and the children's father. So it was very difficult. And as he stopped and said, Mommy, I'm finished talking about elephants now, I turned at the traffic light and right next to me was this huge elephant. It said, in love, thatching. And because of who I am and because of the journey I've led to get to that point, I was like, oh, oh my God, Heath, that's my son. I said, honey, you know what that means? That means everything's going to be okay. Now, my journey has led me to believe that coincidences have always cropped up in my life. And always it would be the way I described it was I'm one of those people that really, honestly, I've got to walk into the sliding door about 10 times before I finally realize you've got to open it to go through it instead of smashing your head on the, on the door. So I've always talked myself down as, as a human being as, and as a person that's picking up on, on things around me. But signs were never one of those things. In fact, I dumbed myself down because I was always very aware of my environment and the things happening around me. So talking about a bird, seeing one at the same time, I always felt like it was a comfort. And Antoinette, I called them love letters from God. I always have. My People that have known me my whole life will know that I did that. So please understand that that elephant was a comfort to our family. And then my son saw them all over the cars, in the parking lot, and the Eastern Cape um, number plate has got elephants on it. So every single car we saw had a car, you know, elephant back in front. And then we went into the hospital and there was the last few minutes of a movie called larger than life and these two a man and an elephant wandered off so that's why it was important to me and it came up two years later when my mother died 
and I found inside um, her handbag that she'd handed me in the hospital when she'd said to me, hide my handbag from dad, I'd found in there uh, the most beautiful poem about the Addo elephants. And it was a famous poem. And, um, and I'm just looking for a picture here. I mustn't sidetrack myself. But it's a famous poem that had inside there this amazing an ode to the elephant, the Addo elephant. And it happened to be inside, and I'm going to show you, it's inside the diary cover. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe we can't. Let me see. Okay. To walk with him is to walk in light. Now, I want you to know that that island, that lighthouse on that island happened to be my home. My husband and I lived there for three years alone. And inside my mom's handbag was this cover. It was an old diary. So it wasn't from that year. And inside was this Ode to an Elephant, the Addo Elephant. And my island, my island, the one that we lived on, uh, it's part of a great nature reserve now called the Greater Addo Elephant Park. And it includes the island. Now, those of you who listened last time know that that island um, I, I spoke about. And But for me, it was up to my mum's death, from the time of that first elephant up until my mum's death, there were always little elephants that popped up that meant we were just blessed and being looked after, even though, honestly, it was a really, really difficult time. So when my mom died, and I found that in, my, in her handbag, while my brother was sitting having a quiet time on the veranda in Morgan Bay overlooking the bay, they'd come rushing down that night. He was having a quiet time, and he said, I didn't realize Morgan Bay had a lighthouse. And he read that exact scripture, which happens to be on that exact diary that happens to be in my mother's handbag with an elephant poem in it, which I didn't see. I put it in my pocket. So those love letters were very, very amazing to me. And so when my two years later, my son was run over by a car bearing the logo of an elephant, please understand that there was nothing that was ever going to be okay again. So I think it's important to answer the question, how did I know? I didn't. I didn't. I was absolutely broken. Not only was he dead, it was my fault because I'd taken my eyes off him, but also the betrayal of this elephant. Because had all three of us been there, we would have in unison said, everything's exactly as it should be. So to answer the question, why do I now, 10 years after my son's death and 12 years after the original elephant, why do I say that everything's exactly as it should be? Because if you go back to the beginning, that is what it meant. And it really meant that. We felt it inside, inside our belly buttons. And it was witnessed by us. And there was like proof and a little thing. And a, so these coincidences were, were different to something you would normally just forget about, you know, like maybe two people having the same name. Or in my case, I, I studied with three Robins. One of them was a boyfriend. One of them was my best friend. One of them ended up, the two of them ended up getting married together. And I remember thinking, my goodness, there's like three Robins in one class, two end up getting married and it wasn't to me, that is a wake-up call. It's a love letter from God. It's a coincidence that's of vital, vital importance. And it was in that instance. I mean, I ended up marrying my husband. But the why came afterwards, Antoinette, in this millions of elephants that came. So I think it's appropriate that at some point, when I give you a chance to talk, <laughs> that I read what... I then discovered in the journey with all the elephants, and if we can, we can speak about a few of the, few of the what I've since learned are synchronicities, and I can give examples. But I do think at some point I need to read to you what I discovered in the trauma of this betrayal of everything that had come before was a lie. I had, in fact, imagined everything and nothing was okay. Robin, please just go ahead and speak because it's coming out beautifully and I'm sure my questions will be answered. And if they're not, I'll put up my hand and we can. Okay. So please okay. go ahead. 
Yeah. So I haven't done this before. Can you actually still see me? Because I want to read to you from something that I have in front of me. Can you read? Can we you can see me? Yeah. Yes. Fabulous. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read. So understand that nothing was okay, but the elephants kept coming. And I'll give examples in a moment. In the most bizarre and beyond belief ways. So this thing of a coincidence wasn't funny. It wasn't okay. There was no love letter. It was a mess. My son was, it, it was not okay. But because they kept coming, I started writing it down. And my husband and my youngest son, Heath, who's 18 now, said, you know, mommy, write that down. And my husband would say, Rob, write that down. No one's ever going to believe that. So I did. I just kept the journal. That island that I lived on with my husband for three years, I kept a diary. So it was part of my healing process to just keep writing, which is what I did. And one of the things I discovered was a person called Carl Jung. Just adore him. I'm so glad I found him. 300 years before Carl Jung, there was a little sentence that said, coincider means falling together. It was in the 1600s, I think. And um, it was, I presume it's Latin. I mean, I'm no rocket scientist. Coincider meant falling together. And that's all it said. It, it was a, a situation of unrelated events which fell together. 300 years later, Carl Jung got that feeling I had about that something's different to these ones. They're not coincidences. There's a something else, and it's over the top because of the feeling that they carry. And he said here, a synchronicity is a coincidence of events that seem related somehow, but not obviously caused by one another. Okay, so they seem related, a coincidence of events that seem related, but not caused by one another. But the key, and that's why Carl Jung actually created the name, the key is that a synchronicity is experienced by the person as a profound feeling of connectedness. While it might not be exp explained by the person that is, it's absolutely remembered for this feeling of connectedness. And if we go to what a coincidence is, a coincidence is something that's understood by all of us. Every, there's not a single person sitting here tonight, if there is anyone other than you and me, um, that hasn't experienced a coincidence. And it's just a fact, it's a, it happens, it's a chance thing without any kind of planning. And it's an incident that you acknowledge, but in the passage of time, you can forget about it. A coincidence is forgotten about. A synchronicity, you will never forget about it. And the, the, the barrage of elephants that came after my son's death were so ridiculous that in writing them down, I eventually got to Google and started researching and ended up in this world where there's a whole lot more going on than, than I had. No, I mustn't say it like that. That there is a whole lot more going on to life than, than anyone might think. But I always knew that. I've known it since I was little. I, I'm... I'm I'm very deeply connected to the earth and I I feel like I'm part of the earth. I, I have a mother, but the planet is my mother. I mean, it feeds me, it looks after me, it takes care of me. It's so so having a sign, it's like having a stop sign or a go sign right in front of you. They they're amazing. They they have always guided me on my path to make me feel that not only was I in the right place at the right time, but that I actually wasn't lost. And that the road that I was on, despite the fact that, oh, my Lord, I have taken some really bumpy roads in my life. These signs, when they come up, mean you're on track. And because of the journey that I've taken, I promise you, I feel like I am guided, I am loved, and I am protected. And the thing that Jung said about the synchronicities is that and, and and the interesting thing here is it's you have to find it in his unpublished works because Carl Jung is the father of modern analytical psychology. Okay. He 
has a lot to say about archetypes, that they're universal things that all of us as humans experience, and they can help us to, to look at the, the seen and the unseen parts of our lives so that we can become more whole as human beings. And I mean, you can get, a, I, I haven't studied psychology, but you, my people do, and you can have a textbook and you can study all the things that Jung said about psychology, but what you won't find, because it's unpublished, is what he had to say about synchronicities. And he said that he felt, because of the feeling, that they opened a portal into another dimension that was right here next to us, equal to our own, that implicated the presence of the divine. He said the presence of a divine intelligence at work. Well, I mean, when I got that, I was like, thank you. I'm not nuts. I have not lost the plot. I mean, I might have. But the witnesses around me that have seen them, I mean, I have them, you know, I have them, I, I've got them, they all over. And, and always witnessed by somebody else, never alone, which I'm really grateful for because it was hard. Yeah, sorry, I shouldn't interrupt you, but I, no, listened, yes. to, I listened to your podcast interview with Wanako, who I see is here with us this evening. Um, and there were so many amazing things gleaned from that in your conversation with him. And one of them I just want to throw in now so you can carry on in this thread is that you said, or he said, I can't remember who, but it came out in the conversation that God comes in different ways to different people. And it came to you through the elephant synchronicities. Hmm. <laughs> Yes. The divine meets you. It is my experience that the divine meets you where you are. And if you're open to it, not so open that all your brains fall out, but if you are open to an awareness that there's a whole lot more going on around us than just ourselves, just on the surface, it's too perfect. This world that we live on is too absolutely perfect. And because I'm a, a nature baby, a, a greenie, what do you want to call me? Because I, I know about that. I, the sun rises, the sun sets. I, when we lived on Bird Island, the roseate turns, and I only found this out afterwards because I didn't have um, a computer at the time and everything we'd written down um, by longhand. And when I left, I wanted to to copy out all the diary entries we'd written in the logbook. Do you know that the roseate turns arrived on the island for two of the three years that we were there, the other time they weren't there when we got there because of the timing, they arrived on exactly the same day. Now, you know, that's big. And I just think that I now am trusting that I've always seen with these eyes and and that betrayal I felt at feeling when my son was run over that, I mean, it wasn't just that he was dead. I mean, I make it sound like I'm making lights, but no one in here thinks that I am. I know that. But it was more than that. It was an absolute smashing to smithereens of every single thing that I had ever stood for. And it made me not just responsible for his death, not just all the things that I felt as a bad mother, but that also I just had made everything up, but I haven't because of the backup that I get from, and it doesn't matter that it's someone that happens to be Carl Jung, because I felt it. And I'd like to give an example of one, a synchronicity that happened for my husband and not, um, that had nothing to do with elephants. But before our son died, my, someone had called us to say there was a, an eagle hanging on the fence. It had obviously flown through to try and catch a rat or something, and its wings had got caught on the fence, so it was spinning. And he went up at, with the boys, and he took it off, just here, right here in Morgan Bay, and he took it off, and they, they, they rehabilitated. The, the three boys rehabilitated this bird, and it was a long-crested eagle. And 
rehabilitated by keeping it calm and steady and waited for it to heal on its own because it was just cut. It wasn't going to die. When they released it, the boys all held, I wasn't there. They held it. It's their thing. They held the, the bird. They, they touched it. And then they just let him go. Do you know that that bird followed us for more than four years every single time we went up the road? It would see us and then it would fly from pole to pole to pole to pole. Now, sure, it could be any, any long crested eagle, but it wasn't. And it used to follow us all the way up to the tar road, about 10 kilometers. And when we came back, we'd see it and we saw it all the time. So for Sean, the long crested eagle became that thing for him that was a comfort. And we had gone down to Cape Town for my mother-in-law's funeral. She died, Sean's mother died six months after our son was killed. And we stopped at a place, we always stopped with the boys. It's called the Heath because our son is called Heath and we like to stop there and play. And this time was devastating because he wasn't there. Anyway, they have an eagle rehabilitation center there. And um, they had new signage and everything. And I, I didn't go. I let Heath and Sean, when I say I let, I was sitting weeping in the garden and they, the two of them went off. And the woman that was at reception, she saw me sitting there howling my eyes out. And they had this interaction with eagles all behind closed doors in the opening. And she asked me what had happened. And I, I, I just very briefly, I just said, you know, I'm battling my son instead. And I said, but I'm so glad my husband's in there because he's got such a deep connection with long-crested eagles. Do you have any in there? So she said, no, no, we don't get the long-crested eagle in this area. I mean, we do occasionally, but we don't. And she said, no, she didn't say anything. After that, I was walking to the car and then she quickly came calling out and look, look. She said, wait, I've got something for you. I want to give you this. This is for your husband. Where is he? So Sean came along and she said, I want to gift you this. It's just a, it's a long crested eagle feather. And I just, I had it in my office and I, I realized as you were about to get in your car and I wanted to give you this. It was very special for us because now this is a little coincidence just two little things you know except as we did the loop to try and drive out she came running screaming waving her arms at us she came in front of the car because it had like a big traffic circle and said stop we were like what she was pointing up at the sky there was a pair of long crested eagles doing a mating dance and they were flying and she said I've worked here for however many years and I had never, ever, ever seen that. And if I tell you about the feeling that we felt, I didn't feel anything. I'm not connected to the long crested eagle. My husband and my son were and we were at the heath and heath was at the heath. We got a long crested eagle feather and there were two mating above us. They were flying and spiraling and joining. I had never seen before or since a display like that. So the divine meets you where you are. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I muted myself because I do too many ums and ums. <laughs> Where are you doing? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I'm interjecting again, but the symbolism Please of eagles. Do. The symbolism of eagles is so huge. And so it was confirmation of the um, from the divine. It's very much a sign from the divine that we'll be protected. That we're it's a very, go and have a look it up. You're very good at, if you haven't already. So it's not a coincidence. It's yeah. a synchronicity that that happened. Sorry, I just needed to say that. Right. Yes. So you know that's one I know I haven't told many people, but I happened to get elephants and I got a lot of them and I got a lot of other synchronicities that had nothing to do with elephants. But the theme that was just a standard the whole way through. Remember, I describe myself as a person that's got to finally, you know, have a bulge on my head before I open the sliding door. Uh, it's not quite like that. I'm hopefully giving you a metaphor to describe. Yeah, you know, something can be sitting right in front of you and you can miss it. I never did miss it. 
but I dumbed myself down and I'm not doing that anymore because there's too much that's planned. And when I say planned, okay, let me, but you know what I also discovered? In my last chat with you, Antoinette, my first, my first chat with anybody in that, in this space, um, I described how I had been right, my mother had broken her, oh, forget now whether it was her ribs or her hips or whatever it was on the night that I'd returned home after my father had been convalescing and was now okay and had come out of intensive care after being stabbed. Okay, so <laughs> that day that I forgot the phone call to say mom has broken her, her hips, I had just finished writing a section of the book that, well, the diaries, because it was now going to be turning into a book, into, well, I was just putting it down um, from handwritten. I, I'd written the section about Bird Island was known as Ile de Chaos, and I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but I thought it meant chaos, and I must trust me, there was like a lot of chaos going on. And when in the writing of it, later and the researching, I researched it and discovered that chaos didn't, Ile de Chaos didn't mean chaos, it meant flat island. So the way that I now view the world and have always viewed the world, but now I take it seriously, made me then go and think, well, well, there's a lot of chaos going on. Well, if chaos isn't chaos, and there certainly was, then, because that's a synchronicity. I thought it meant chaos. It didn't mean chaos. It meant something else. So what the hell is chaos? What is chaos? And up pops the thing called the chaos theory. Now, I'm not a brainy person, but a whole lot of really brainy people have mathematics, uh, mathematicians and physicists and all these people, they've they will be able to explain to you all about the chaos theory. And the part that I'll take away, the little bit that I get, is that chaos isn't chaos. They tell you this because of all their really complicated ways of explaining things. In the very, very center of the chaos theory is the idea that chaos is a mix between pattern, order, and complete and utter whatever this is, the unexpected, right in the very center. And they even give it a name, they call it um, a strange attractor. So the strange attractor is the common denominator that makes chaos have these incredible patterns. And when you see it, because obviously they've got to describe it and they do these experiments, the patterns that chaos has are the most exquisite patterns you'll ever see in your life. I mean, it looks like when I grew up as a kid, we had this thing called spirograph, where you use one little pencil in a circle and you just kept going, 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 going. And it's just perfect. And every time you try something different, you get a more and more beautiful pattern. That's chaos. It didn't feel like it though. It didn't feel beautiful. It didn't feel ordered. But Robin, one of the things, yeah, I, I, I really picked up from your interview with Wanako uh, is that exact thing you're saying now, that nature operates on that same system came up in that conversation about the chaos. And one of the biggest things I got out of that talk that you offered was, and Wanako did too, was that life is about good and bad, dark and light, and all of it is the divine, actually. And it's all po it's all perfect, actually. Yes, yes. So I did, and I think I'd like to, I personally would like to say this here. I had a podcast uh, last night that I'm very pleased that I did, and I'm very um, happy and with everything that I said, and there's no part of it that I personally want to take back. But what I found myself doing there in a very appropriate way, it just came in the same way as this conversation's coming. There's nothing planned. There's nothing written down. It's just kind of happening as it comes. Is I did a lot of explaining yesterday of my way of seeing and explaining what I'd experienced because of the upbringing that I had. And that is something I don't want to do anymore. So just like I'm done with dumbing myself down, I am done with explaining why from the perspective of my faith that I was brought up in, 
things looked like this, this, and this. That I'm not going to do. And the gift of last night's podcast is that while I explained every single thing that was on my heart, I don't need to do that again because it's too divisive, it's too complicated, and actually the complex system that is the planet is really very simple. There's nothing very complicated about the incredible beauty we see around us and the fact that the earth is spinning and the sun rises and it sets. There are principles that govern nature. There are principles that govern chaos. Those same principles are the guiding signposts that take us and carry us through our lives. And that was my experience. But it took 12 years to get there. <laughs> it wasn't okay. I'd like to give you an example of one of the things. So I hated these elephants. I mean, I really hated them. I don't have anything to do with them. I know I explained in the first interview with you, Antoinette, of how I made some joke to my son about how I just wanted to shoot all these elephants. Please understand I'm originally a, a, a game ranger. So I, there's some elements of that that I, you know, could be forgiven for saying. But an example. It happens now. It's years and years and years. And at some point, I underwent, I don't know what a nervous breakdown is, but I know that I got to a point where I absolutely could not handle a lot of things. A lot of things. There's always a catalyst. And yes, there was a catalyst. We don't need to go into that now. But I decided, I found a, a uh, there was a, a doctor recommended to me by someone, a doctor who also happens to be a homeopath, a kinesiology, kinesiologist and a reflexologist, I don't know, all the ologists, but she was a medical doctor. And I'm a practical person. I want a doctor. Okay? I want to know how I was doing. And she happened to be running a course at the Buddhist retreat. Now, I love this because I was going on a healing retreat about medicine at the Buddhist retreat that had nothing to do with going on a Buddhist camp or whatever you do if you're a Buddhist. And I went on the way there. On When I was going, my husband said, look, love, we've got to accept everything that's happened to us. There's an element of every single thing that's happened. I surrender. Because of the number of elephants, he said to me, I absolutely, I surrender. It's what it is. You go and have the most amazing time. And he gifted me with a little bracelet of elephants all holding on to each other. Nose. And I lost it. Did I mention this in the last? I might have mentioned it on the first chat. But I, I was gifted with that. And I lost it on his birthday. I did. I mentioned it at that last chat. I actually lost that one on his birthday, the 3rd of August. And it was the first elephant I was actually trying to find. And you would think I would have got it because if I can use the Buddhist retreat again and all these incongruous things that didn't all make sense, like seeing a doctor at the Buddhist retreat, it doesn't make sense. We were at lunch the one day and she was so sweet. She said, There's, you see that really good looking guy that's sitting over there? Um, he's a Sangoma and he'll do, if anyone feels like going, you can go to him. I was like, I'm South African, so I know what a Sangoma is. It's a, it's a, spiritual healer in the African tradition, except this man was six foot, blonde, and white skinned. In fact, he was from, I don't know, some country that didn't appear to be African, even though I'm African, he certainly didn't look like he was African. And Sangomas I only ever knew were African. So while everyone else was going, no, I don't want to go and see a Sangoma, I thought, yes. When I got there, he asked me if I wanted to ask him anything, and I had absolutely nothing I wanted to say. So he said, okay, well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. And he starts telling me the story about how his mother was from Wales and how she always wanted to meet elephants. She had this thing about elephants and she came to live in Zimbabwe so she could be closer to elephants and ended up marrying his father, who was a game ranger, and he was born. And while his mother was pregnant with him, she was visited by a whole lot of African women who came to her, put their hands on her tummy and said, the child you're carrying is going to be a Sangoma. And the group of um, healers that he's going to belong to is called Abantu Lendlofu, which means the people of the elephant. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, wh why is he telling me this? I'd said nothing. 
the thing that came next was even more stupid or whatever the word is you want to explain. And this man exists, okay. I have his phone number, we can phone him. This happened, I didn't make it up. He had this white thingy around his neck, like a scarf, much like the one you've got. It was on both sides. He's sitting cross-legged and he's now going to, I think it was, he was gonna throw bones and then from there, my ancestors, if they had anything to say, in fact, they didn't, by the way. But if there were, and he said, if there's anything to be said, I will tell you. And if there's nothing to be said, then so be it. And he took this off and he flicked it. Oh, because after that, I told him, I said, there's this animal. I didn't have a question, but there is this animal ever since before and after my son's death. And I mentioned, I said, they're everywhere. They're even here at the Buddhist retreat. And... Um, so he said, okay, well, let's see what happens. I didn't mention what it was, even after he told me the story about all his elephants. And he flicked this onto the floor in front of him to put throw the bones on. And as he flicked it, I said, see, there's a there's its toenail. And he said, what? I said, there's an elephant toenail. The animal is an elephant and it's on your scarf. And he laughed at me. He said, no, man, this whole thing, I've had it for years. There's no elephants on here. Shame, you're seeing them everywhere. I looked at him. It was the upside down. I turned it around. I flicked it in his direction. I said, look, there's an elephant. Now, I want you to know, this is a man. He, his eyes got this big. I mean, I, I still don't know how it's possible that he didn't see it. It was this big. It was huge. It was a white cloth with a black stylized elephant drawing on it. Do you know that that was the moment, the defining moment when I knew that there was nothing to ask anyone, there was no question that I needed answered, that it was just what it was always. In that moment, I didn't need a doctor, I didn't need a Buddhist, I didn't need a Sangoma, because I'd seen an elephant that he had not seen that he carried around his neck for goodness sake in his practice. And the peace I got from that took me back to then, however many years that was. And then I came back from the Buddhist retreat and lost the bangle that I'd got from my husband on my son's birthday. Robin, that's uh, thank you. I, I'd like to also throw into the pot maybe a question for an experience and a question since our last interview. <laughs> the incredible thing is you and I are both so new at this. We just kind of yes. dived into it and uh, it just shows that divine order is at play. So you sent me a message to say that a woman in America who may be listening now um said that your interview had such an impact on her can you well, share that see. and then can you share maybe the question she is there she asked? maybe what she is, is her there. name cindy are you out there uh she's not on the screen but maybe she's there and she's not cindy oh wait 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 i think she is cindy pearsall yes, sorry to put you there. on the spot like this but we're also new at this Cindy's here, Hi. yes, she is here. Okay, so how does she ask a question? Well, maybe she just, oh, no, she can't she speak. Did. She asked the question to you, you sent it to me. She, can I read the question out? Please do, because I don't remember these things. <laughs> she said, can you help me understand, Robin, why I've had such an immediate turnaround in my depression stroke grief just from the stories you told on the last interview we did. I was at a point of not wanting to live and that has just melted away as if the elephants are almost magically healing. Can you understand or explain that power? I can, for me, especially after my podcast last night where I was explaining what they meant for me because of my, my background and my experience, that thing that I am no longer going to do. The reason you feel a healing, a something, a something, I don't know what you're feeling, 
that you've described as best you can. And my way to answer that is because a synchronicity is a portal into a realm that exists. I'm just quoting Jung. A realm that exists right here next to us that is insinuating the presence of the divine. And a synchronicity is not a coincidence. A coincidence you forget about. A synchronicity you feel in your belly button. So if I can get out of the way and stop explaining what I think happened, but just tell the story, you felt it. And it's that feeling that was the key that took 300 years from one little sentence of coincidence, meaning fall, falling together, for Jung to pick up on. And I think that once we start speaking about this, the elephant in the room, so to speak, more and more people will be able to trust that. You can call it whatever you want. I don't know. I mean, that I haven't Googled, but probably there are people all over the place that are talking about this as, as something you can really, really trust. Trust your belly button. Another thing is, what, does it matter what it what means? What exactly do you mean by that? I mean, you... It's got a feeling, think... Antoinette. There's a feeling of peace. Like, I described to you what happened with Sean with the, with the, the eagle. I did not feel a single thing. I was crying. There were eagles. My boy and his father were watching this. My husband was in tears. They felt it. It was their thing. It wasn't mine. But so can I make comes a, with that. Can I make a suggestion? You know, I interviewed Gary, who was meant to die of cancer in a minute or oh, a day or an hour, and he's still alive six years later. And he talked about when he was given this diagnosis. Sorry, Cindy, I think this is going to answer your question. I hope. I don't know. We're having a conversation, Robin. He said that when he got the diagnosis that he could die literally any second, he went into this place of extreme healing, actually. And he described that healing as just, and I think you and Wanako discussed this as well, that indescribable peace that supersedes everything. So that is who we really are. That's what I understood from that conversation. Mm -hmm. That's who we really are. So undercutting all the, the suffering and the hardship and the drama and the depression and the external stuff and our minds yeah. and our egos mm -hmm. is who we really are, which is that is that part of ourselves that that's the, the peace of that part of ourselves supersedes anything. But we don't access it very often yes. until we in extreme trauma so i accessed it when i was in a plane crash which didn't crash but we had a crash landing <laughs> and i didn't know why i had experienced that extreme peace and calm until i interviewed gary and gary talked about it when he got this brutal cancer diagnosis and then i had people after that podcast saying but I experienced the same when I was ex I was uh, diagnosed with cancer. So, Cindy, possibly what happened and what happened with you, some of us take a long time. I had it in the plane crash. Then it went away. I went back into all my mind and my ego and my pain body. And then I got cancer and I did experience that joy Gary talks about in that piece. And then mm -hmm. I lost it. And now I've got it back after three and a half years. It took you 12 years. But actually, that's what undercuts everything. So the possibility exists that you, through just sharing your story, has enabled someone like Cindy to go right through the depression and the trauma and whatever it is straight into that portal of who she really is. Sorry, I had to just say it. Uh, Antoinette, I think, I don't think, I, I believe without a shadow of a doubt that what you're saying is true. And, you know, I'm, I'm speaking out like this for the first time. I don't have a script in front of me. Um, you know, I, one of the things I've always done by dumbing myself down, friends my, of mine will, will attest to that, to say, you know, I don't always agree with what I think, or maybe I'm wrong, or you know what? I'm going to tell you what I think, and what I think is that the nature of the divine is nature, and it is natural for us. 
it is natural for us to be connected to this world that we live on and every single living and non-living thing. It is our nature. It can't be other. I mean, I'm not from Mars. Sometimes I behave like I'm from Mars, but I'm actually not. So the nature of everything that is on this magnificent planet, I mean, I, is that it's got that thread that weaves its way through everything, and it is our nature. So yes, if Jung can describe it as a portal, an opening into that, then why can't it happen in a flash? Why can't it be instantaneous healing? And does it matter how you get it? Yeah, can I just read you what Wanaka and Cindy said? Sorry, I'm interrupting you a lot tonight, but it seems to be, is that okay? <laughs> you must... So Cindy said, I have no connection to elephants, yet they, through you, have brought me back from the edge. So the portal is the synchronicity. And Wanaka said, knowing we are not alone is healing. And Esther yes. said, yes, at one point, there are no more questions necessary anymore. Yes. That's the experience I had when I saw a Sangoma, from, not from here, originally from Wales, in a Buddhist retreat. I didn't have to ask him a single thing. I do not remember a single thing that came after that. All I knew is that I knew what I knew, and I knew that everything was exactly as it should be, even though it didn't feel like it. And since then, the piecing together of my life and making meaning is just a natural process. So when a natural, I say natural, I'm not saying easy. Please, please understand that the person that's sitting here in front of you with her hair brushed for a change is not the person who's got all her together. But I promise you, that when I lose it and I don't have it together, I am reminded. And in my particular set of circumstances, I mean, you know, from the story when we chatted last week, when I ran over that man, he, he ran in front of my car and I got gifted with elephants wrapped in red bows from the insurance assessor. Now, those are the kinds of things that do support in terms of synchronicity. I'll give you an example. Since our chat last week, it occurred to me that it's actually completely silly that I live three and a half to four hours away from Addo Elephant Park. I've never been around wild ele elephants and I am going to go and book into, I, I'm going to go and I'm going to see elephants. So I get hold of somebody that I used to work with. His name is Ryan. How's it, Ryan? I don't know if you're here. Ryan, how do I get to Addo Elephant? I want to see elephants like right up close. Well, guess what? Ryan is not just a colleague. Ryan was the guy that drove the boat to get my husband and I to and from Bird Island all those years ago. Guess what? Ryan is the senior ranger at Addo Elephant Park. That is not a mistake. That's a synchronicity. Will I get to go? Will I actually go and see an elephant? Will I actually get my act together to go? Maybe not, but you know what? Everything is okay. It has to be it because that's just ridiculous. Why didn't I get hold of Joe? Or why doesn't Ryan now work with, I don't know, Partridge in Jerusalem? For goodness sake. <laughs> and what happened to me today, Robin? How does that happen? Well, Antoinette and I had a few, um, we were trying to look at ways to frame some of the things that were going to be spoken about today. And we, I'm delighted to say, decided to just actually throw all of those out and not frame anything and just come winging in at the last minute after prayer and 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 asking God for guidance or asking the divine to guide us through this. And because of what happened to Antoinette, so it's your turn. What happened today? So I, Go on. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've seen thousands of real elephants in my life, unlike Robin, <laughs> interestingly, because I've been to many game parks. <laughs> so interesting. And yet they've never had any of this kind of symbolism or synchronicity for me. But I haven't seen an elephant for many, many, many years just because of where my life's taken me. But today I drive into the city, which is one hour from where we live. 
And on the way back out of the city, two things happened within an hour. Uh, well, the first was I went to buy a smoothie at a health shop. <laughs> and while they're taking a very long time, I just look around a bit and I look to my left and I see this picture on the wall. And what did it say? It was very poignant about elephants. I, well, it was I can't a, just a remember. jolly large elephant. I've got it here. Let me see what it says. Because you see, it's not jolly about the large. elephant. <laughs> Oh, it says, I didn't read it. Oh, this is funny. It says, understanding elephants. Let me see if I can mm -hmm. show you. Where am I? It says, um, understanding this. elephants. And we were going to talk about how did she understand the message from the elephants? And that's no, down, down, Robin, down. Anyway, at the top of that post, it says, understanding elephants. And I, know, I'm, I would never even look for something like that then i'm driving home in my car and i turn the news on i never listen to the news because in our country it's murder corruption fraud you, robbery but for some reason i turned the news on two minutes before i came and after the fraud corruption and robbery came a lot of time about 10 minutes about elephants they had found the skeleton of elephants on an island off um somewhere in the, the western west coast Kaka. and robin uh as you all know lived on an island for three years and then they were talking about finding elephant skeletons on wrecked ships and i was like how does this happen in 45 minutes so on the very day we we're talking about the meaning of elephants so there we go so so I say it's not about the elephants, just like it wasn't for me about the eagle for my husband. It was his thing. It's about the connectedness and the feeling that you get from that. So that little picture that I've just shown, and maybe we'll, I'll, we can, I'll post it to uh, when you do the the posting tomorrow, because it says the elephant reintegration trust. Now I've got a word that I've got stuck on my computer here. And Robin, hasn't trust come up as a big thing? In my life and people around me, trust has come up as a huge thing. And here we are actually talking about trust. Well, it's enormous. It's my word for the year. It's my word for the year because how can I not trust myself? How can I not trust the divine? How can I not trust that everything's okay. My son told me there was another baby coming for me and that he had chosen, I chose you and daddy for myself instead. How more blessed can one human be that her dead child, the one that died six days after saying that, left me with that. So I am going to trust this. And when I ran over Lewis, the the elephants that came wrapped with the big red ribbon in that beautiful picnic basket those men gifted me said that I'm a ruler trust. And now we've got trust written on my computer. The other one said, listen, I've thrown that away. The other little bit of it said, oh, I'm not going to do that. Anyway, <laughs> the, other bit, the other bit said, listen. <laughs> So Wanaka said something lovely here. There are no degrees of difficulty in miracles. And one of the things that I've always shared about my journey, which is different to yours, but the same journey, is that actually we eventually get to a place where we open our arms and the butterflies land. Miracles just land. Whereas we spend our whole lives going out with this net trying to catch them. And it's such hard work. And I also loved something else you both said today. Wanaka said, I think, well, sorry, I keep on quoting it, but it was quite a profound conversation. I listened to it today. That's why I say today is when you go slowly, that's actually when things happen very fast. I can't say I exactly understood that when you said that, but I, it seemed very profound to me. Well, it's interesting that you are quoting him so very much. Because there's a sense of um, there's a sense of there's a sense of connectedness with some of the things that came up. One of the reasons I'm not going to go there again, and I 
that podcast is available for anyone to have a look at is not because there's a single word that I want to take back from what I said, but that it was the context with which I was expressing myself was coming from a part of myself that was not yet healed. And it has to do with explaining myself ad infinitum, ad nauseum, in a very clear way. I've done it my whole life. I, I am a communicator, but oh my gosh, have I, I can sing Baba Black Sheep and someone else will hear me singing Mary Had Little Lamb. So I'm not going to do that anymore. And the gift of last night was that it gave me the in to say what my context was. And my context for using things like they were love letters from God was my background. Saying things like um, elephants were a, um, a, a vehicle for the Holy Spirit to enter into my life. That's the language that I grew up with. But the thing that is important to me and why I'm not going to stop trusting or complicate things by explaining the context that I came from, I want to go forward. That path that's behind me there. I want to go forward with this and just trust it because for you, it's a butterfly. For you, it's an eagle. For you, it might be, I don't know, some arbitrary thing. Like if it feels like this is really special, wake up, wake up and trust it because it's not off planet. It's not like it's come in a spaceship. It's not like you don't know where it came from. You don't know, it's not that you don't know who's interpreting it. It's you, you're looking at it and you're going, oh my word, that is really amazing. When that happens, please, please trust it. And, and I, I didn't. think Robin, it speaks so much to trusting ourselves. Sorry, I, sorry to keep interrupting you, but no. the one thing I've realized, and I'm nearly sixty, is that I never trusted myself and God and life and everything because this path we're talking about. Sometimes we've been deviated from it. Sorry, this is just coming through me now. It because needs to be said. It needs to be said. So spiritual bypassing is a big thing I talk about on quite a lot of the conversations I have with people. And maybe that's almost what you were speaking about on that other podcast is we've been led astray by our socialization. And I even say spiritualization by so many things to not trust anything that's out of that uh that conditioning i don't know if that's making sense now so there's a conditioning that says if it's outside of that don't trust it so to be honest with you that made me an outsider my whole life and i think you too you and i've talked about this a lot i was an outsider i was the black sheep i was the strange one so I just started trusting myself less and less, actually. So yep. I got to a point yep. where I got cancer. You've had your own traumas, and I, and I had to wake up. And when you are called to wake up, you've got to start trusting who you are, what you get, what your path is. And that is not easy for human beings because it, it means you're not always accepted. It means sometimes you feel odd. I'll let you It's um, it's terrifying, but what lockdown did is you can't get stranger than strange. In lockdown, when we could finally see people, and it must be said that lockdown for me was absolutely fantastic, and I'm very deeply sorry for people who had a terribly traumatic time, but I am very fortunate to live in a beautiful place that had a big gate, and I could just close it. and. Um, when we came out, because of the language that people were framing their experience in, I have never felt more comfortable with being myself than I was meeting traumatized people who, when I said, well, you know, I've always felt the earth's heartbeat through my feet. Nobody looked at me funny. They, they, they didn't. And a synchronicity happens to be that my mother his maiden name was Proudfoot. I am my mother's daughter. I'm not her. I don't see the world the way she does. But the synchronicity of that thing and being able to know 
that I can be grounded and not have to be accepted. And I say that with the same level of pain that I promise you I felt in terms of the betrayal of those elephants and the death of my son. Because I want to be liked. I want to be accepted. I don't want to be the strange, odd person who can feel the earth's heartbeat through her feet. Well, you know what? I can. And I do. And this story is not my story. And it was only when I realized that it needed to be told that I was able to let it out. It is the story. And that's why people like Cindy, and Cindy, I'm so glad you didn't take those pills. And I'm so glad that you are here. I mean, for me, that is a profound expression of somebody getting, I mean, she is like a shining light for me. I mean, is it possible that someone could hear a story you and I had and then didn't jump off the edge? It's worth it. And it's worth Cindy, being. Yes. So, Robin, what Cindy, Cindy, you have no idea. Oh, my ears are ringing now. Your role in all of this, because what you've brought to this now is that that we have to trust what comes and who we are, and out of that comes all the magic and all the miracles. Um, so thank you for showing up to share that. And the other thing in terms of nature, because we're not going to have a one and a half hour chat this time. <laughs> we'll do more of these if anyone wants. But one of the things I'd like to, to mention here is that thing of, of our nature. It is our nature to be human. And I am so tired of having to hide my humanness. I mentioned it maybe last night or maybe on the first time. The one that I remember is being told not to wear my heart on my sleeve. Well, I mean, this is about as crazy as meeting a Sangoma at the Buddhist retreat when you're going to be healed by a doctor. I mean, how can I not? This is who I am, clearly. I mean, when you, you know, what I can do is learn to frame it better and framing it better comes with being loved and accepted. So if you keep slapping the kid down and putting it in a corner and telling it to shush, it's going to come out all squiff. So this acceptance, this, this open opportunity to just say it, don't explain it, just say it. It's what it is. I don't know what it is for someone else, but this is what it is for me. Robin, what you've done for me is you've brought the concept of the elephant in the room. And I think there are so many elephants in the room that need to be recognized and spoken right now. And, and COVID and the global situation is showing that for all that it is. We can no longer hide all of that. We've got to have these open, vulnerable, authentic, messy, beautiful, miraculous. Cindy just said it's miraculous to me. So it's all the same. That's what uh, Wanako said, the Course of Miracles teaches. It's all the same. Out of the messy comes the miracle. And that's where we've been led astray, I think, that it's all. <laughs> or, or, and I think this is important here, or if you don't think it's the same, scroll on. Don't be like Robin and get into a messy fight on Facebook because somebody said something about the color of their bathroom that you didn't like. Don't go there. If you don't resonate, if that connectedness isn't working for you, if you don't feel that, trust it, move on. Don't stay there. Don't stay there. In, in the faith in which I was brought up, there are guidelines that say test against that, test against it. So if you are a whoever living somewhere that has no frame of res reference for any words that may be used in texts, sacred texts of any kind of, um, you know, any sacred texts, then if you don't understand them, use the ones that you know. Use yeah. the ones that you know and, and, and check against people in authority that you know and trust because trust me you're going to get led astray if you're going to get led astray and you're going to end up in a black hole if you're going to be led in a black hole i mean but the nature of nature is for us to feel and experience all of these things mm -hmm. and we yeah i think what i was trying to say robin is that it's all of it is the divine the messy 
it's not just all love and light and zen. It's it's messy and it's ooky and it's hard and it's beautiful and it's uh, it's all of it. And we don't have to suppress any of it. It's all right. Yes, yes, and it's it's this thing that's so very very important because when we can be more accepting and loving, this is speaking of somebody that is neither accepting nor loving very often. So please, I have not yet ascended into sainthood to be all these things that I know are important to be. But when we know that, it certainly helps incrementally to get to a place of acceptance of each other. And I mean, the world is in a mess when we can do that more. I mean, I'm just trying to get on with, you know, my own partner in my own house or the person in my campsite, or my neighbor, or and, and so it goes up, but it starts here. So it's very helpful to have a Cindy that can validate something, or an Antoinette that says, well, you know what, actually, okay, well, let's chat. Or so many elephants that eventually you realize, you know what, you haven't actually lost your mind, and you don't need anybody to reinforce it, even the guy wearing the damn elephant around his neck. If you don't see the elephant in the room, just sit with it. Trust me, it's going to come up at some point. Yes. Thank you, Robin. Is do you want? I don't think there's any questions. I'll just scroll through all of this. Is there a parting? Do you want to part with something? And do you want to remind people where they can find you? Or although I think most people here know well, you, but few people. That's an interesting one. I would maybe like to end on one short story. Stories are stories. Okay. Won't be short. They, we don't do short. We take the long way around. Um, the question okay. about where to find me. So the place to find me right now will be on Facebook, exactly where I didn't want to be found. But nevertheless, that's where I'll be found. Robin Rome um, will be found on Facebook, and I'll navigate my way. But the question, more importantly, is where I will be found. I want to tell a little story. My husband and I are returning to where we were when we left to go to find an island to live on, and that happens to be Namibia. And we are going back there to live. My husband is Namibian, and we want to live together and not have to school our child uh, in a separate place so that we live apart. And I feel like I need to say this because the people whose house we're buying don't know this person that's sitting here telling the story, and they don't even know the story. But my husband has found a house that was not for sale, That is absolutely perfect for us. He happened to bump into a friend, little synchronicity, an old surfer who said, okay, what are we looking for? I put an order of a house that's impossible to get. I wanted to have grass. I wanted to have big trees. I wanted lots of privacy. I wanted it to be in a really old part of um, th this area that we're going to be moving to. It's the desert. There's no trees, okay? There's no grass. There's no, anyway. Anyway, he said, come with me. Sean had four days. Come with me. I'm going to evaluate a house that's not for sale, but come with me and you can have a look. Anyway, this house is perfect, 100% perfect. And during lockdown, I asked the friend to say, please, would you contact these people and tell them that I really, really, really would like to live in that house. It's got trees. Got, it's got everything that we would like. When you buy a property or ask, obviously you don't know and you don't interact, you interact through somebody. And only once we've put it to him, we were advised not to. But I just wanted to tell them. They were stuck in New York in lockdown and we were stuck here. And I just wanted to let them know that the buyer of the house that one day they would in fact be selling was me. I then found out his name because he was willing then to enter into, we can chat, wait for us, lockdown when we get back. I then Googled his name, and I won't tell you who he is right now, but it said under Google that this man is known as the elephant whisperer of Namibia. Yes, he has a diploma in elephants. He knows all the elephants in northern Namibia by name. He runs an elephant safari company, and the head office of his company is the house I'm buying. So what I do want to end on is, am I buying the house yet? Well, we have first option to purchase. Can I even get into the country in lockdown? No. Will I end up buying it? This is key here. It doesn't mean you get your way. It just means you're on track. 
it just means I'm on track. So my plan for moving towards Namibia today is on track because of the guiding signposts I have in the, in the form of synchronicity that have stayed with me for all these years. But yes, mm. it may mean we don't because it's moment to moment to moment. Mm. Robert, that's amazing. I'm going to just read, if you don't mind, what Cindy and Norma said, because it's quite profound. Cindy said, I'm in Alabama, USA. So we're in South Africa. I'm sure everyone got that. I couldn't cope with the loss of my son, who died four months ago. I had no connection with Robin at all. Yet we connected, and her stories gave me the one thing I needed to live, hope. I was no longer able to feel like I couldn't live. This story can save many lives. I have goosebumps, Robin. So thank you, Robin, for showing up. Thank you, Cindy, for sharing that. Thank you. Norma said, there have been so many synchronicities for me, including two elephants, butterflies, sunflowers, and the numbers 9 and 11, going back 12 years now. So your chat truly resonates with me. Robin, I think you and I both have to thank the divine first, the elephants, and ourselves, actually, just for being here. And, um, and for everybody who's been at the other end of this. Um, thank, thank you, Robin. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Antoinette, very, very much. And thank you, everyone, for asking for more. Yeah, and we we there's more if you'd like more. So um, we'll see you soon. Eh? I think. Good night, Bye. Robin, and bless, you bless everybody. And um, thank you, Cindy. I hope you're going to talk to us one day. Good Bye. night and lots of blessings. Bye. <laughs>